O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and I meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Have you ever felt like that? Uh, I was thinking about, you know, times perhaps I felt sad in life. Uh, I was thinking of adding some other emojis there, maybe even disappointed, uh, angry, upset. Uh, I'm sure we've, we can identify. We're all humans, so we can identify with this, and we each have our own story. Um, as I was thinking this past week, I, for some reason, I guess, a little bit traumatized by this incident, but just uh, an old friend. Uh, and, and just didn't, the conversation went a certain way where I got yelled at, and, and, and that was a, a sad moment, a memory that came up. Uh, this week, uh, we were visiting my sister in Ottawa, and on the way, uh, a known problem with our car model uh, and year and make, the engine just seized, and in hindsight, it was very dangerous. There was a big poof of cloud, like smoke, and when I opened the hood, uh, there was smoke coming out of the engine, and apparently the, the, the car dealership said that uh, a, even a piston exploded, and there was shrapnel everywhere. Uh, long story short, God, I don't have time to get into it, but God was so gracious and good, and everything is working out. Uh, but the point being, um, just times in your life when uh, you might feel like this. Now, what I want to ask more importantly is then, in those circumstances, do you have a happiness that can transcend, that can go above what's happening to you, uh, what you're feeling inside? Can you, do you have a happiness that can be even stronger than the initial sadness, disappointment, anger that you feel? Do you have a happiness that trans, transcends what happens to you? Because if we're honest, most of the time, our happiness depends on what happens to us. And so happiness, even at least in the English language, it's built on the whole notion our happiness depends on what happens to us, right? Do you have a happiness that can transcend what happens to you? Uh, happiness, pursuing happiness, that's why, therefore, just living in this broken world, um, more in biblical terms, fallen creation, as we try to pursue happiness, that's why it's such hard work to stay happy. The system's broken. And so we're constantly trying to replenish our happiness by our own work, our own effort, uh, you know, try to, trying to be concrete. Perhaps that's why some of us are foodies, literally trying to replenish that sensation that makes us happy, but not just food. It could be anything. It, name it. From small things to big things, something that we are, by our own effort, our own work, trying to replenish this happiness that keeps leaking for some reason. And we can trace it all the way back to Adam and Eve before fallen creation, when, when creation became fallen creation, when Adam and Eve decided, they were at the fork in the road, and they decided to look outside of God as their true and ultimate happiness. 
They look to something outside God, outside themselves, other than God, uh, to their own egos, their own God-likeness, to the fruit of the forbidden tree that look beautiful. Now the Christian hope, just to give you the bookends, if that's fallen creation, the Christian hope is one day we will get to that place where Christ gathers His church, all His people, and we will once and for all and forever know God and experience Him as our true and only and lasting happiness. That's the hope of being a new creation in Christ, what we're working toward, even as we look forward to, more broadly speaking, the new creation, all of new creation uh, in Christ. So we come to David in Psalm 63, and I want you to notice that at the end, David is going through a difficult time. I'm going to spell that out for us uh, in a second. But I want you to see his conclusion. The king, first he's speaking of himself, the king will rejoice. And so David here is saying, no, I have a happiness that transcends what I'm going through. I have a happiness, I have a reason to rejoice, to exult. That, that word David uses there for happiness, exulting, is like an intense happiness. So David says, I have something that can make me happy beyond my circumstances. So let's, know, let's paint a picture of what his circumstances were here in Psalm 63. Um, commentators say he was probably between 60 and one commentator even boils it down, uh, just uh, reduces it to he's 67 years old. I don't know how he calculates that, but all the commentators generally agree in, in his 60s. And so you could say, humanly speaking, he's arrived. He's been ruling for approximately 30 years. Of course, he had some missteps along the way, but he repented. He was restored to God. And so this was supposed to be a time in his reign as king that were supposed to be golden years. But during this time, one of his sons, Absalom, stirs up an insurrection against his own father and vies for the throne. And to add insult to injury, he shames his father, the king, David, by doing deplorable things with his uh, wives, his concubines, on the palace roof to display that you know, just how much he is in power and so forth. And so David here, where he's supposed to be in his golden years, he's supposed to have arrived and be accomplished and just sailing into the sunset, his world is falling apart. And so you can even imagine, I imagine he, David was a, a human being in touch with all his emotions and, and just a very self-aware human being. I imagine there was shame. Was this because of how I raised my son and how I led my family even. I'm sure he went through those kind of thoughts. But really, his life falling apart. Probably a million different thoughts and questioning going on. Even the vision for his government and his nation being threatened here. And yet, in this context, David at the end says, but the king will be happy. I have a reason to be happy beyond my circumstances. And so with David, I hope you and I can pray something according to these lines. Lord, help me find happiness in you that transcends my circumstances. This is a big theme of New Testament Christianity. A very important element, a a muscle in following Jesus that we're meant to develop. Peter says it in his letters. James says it in his ways. Jesus says it in his own words to, oh, that fear not, I've overcome the world. We're to find a happiness in God, in our hearts, that transcends our circumstances. That Jesus and his gospel are to be strong enough to comfort us through all our wildernesses. So I want to ask for the rest of our time together, how does Jesus' gospel of grace provide that ultimate happiness? Okay, this is a very practical outworking of faith in Christ. This is something we're supposed to experience and, and have a real benefit as we place our faith in Jesus and follow him. 
and pursue him as our ultimate happiness? How does Jesus and his gospel provide that? So I want to ask uh, three or four more questions to help unpack that. And so first, who was David's happiness in Psalm 63? David found happiness very specifically in personal relationship with God. In his wilderness, as his wilderness, as his world is falling apart, David comes back to him. The way he starts is, Oh God, you are my God. We saw in one psalm that was unpacked by Colin that first the psalmist was referring to God in third person, then transitioned to uh, first person. But here David, in his world falling apart, he gets right to crying out to God, one-on-one, heart to heart. Oh God, you are my God. And so I want you to notice here, and, and an application we can draw from this, one way to possibly identify the functional God in your life, like who is truly God in your life, who really functions as God in your life, is what is most personal to you. What is most personal to you? So I want you to try to self-reflect. Perhaps answers will come even right now in your seats, or perhaps this is something to reflect on through the week. But if you were to fill in this blank, if you were to write Psalm 63, blank, you are my God. Early I seek you. Earnestly I seek you. What what would be your honest fill in the blank? Who is your functional God? Now some of us, we might fill in, if we're honest, might be more of a what thing, an object, or a substance, or something, or a title. But I think at the end of the day, the question is not a what, but it's really who is your God? Because even those what things, those things that perhaps are our God sometimes, are our idols, it's really serving you. And so it's really about who is your God? Is it God or is it yourself? And as you pursue all these other idols, really you're trying to serve yourself and try to control your life as if you were God. And so the question still is, who was David's God? It's all about a who. Ultimately in life, it's about a who. Who is most important in your life? Is it God or is it yourself or some other person or things that serve yourself? So how would you fill in this blank? How would you fill in this blank? Here are some questions that I asked to help you identify uh, when we started the psalm series in Psalm 1, and it's worth repeating. What do you naturally defend? What do you naturally become angry about? The answer to that question probably behind it is an indication of who might be your God. What do you keep looking at? What do you worry about? can answer these questions most likely behind that you you can sort of investigate and then deduce well if I'm worrying so much about this then perhaps it means that this is my God okay to put it I mean even the answer to what you worry about Paul in his letter at one point he says I'm anxious for the churches Paul was worrying about the churches And so that could be, I think, even a healthy worry because he's worrying about God's business and his things. So just trying to illustrate how you answer this question might point to what or who is truly your God. What are you willing to move on in relationships for? What uh, ultimately becomes a wedge between someone you're in a friendship with or a relationship with? And very just innocently, simply put, what makes you smile? Just commend these questions to you, self-reflective questions that might help you identify how you fill in the blank. Now, I want to ask next then, when? When was David happy? And there's something insightful here in Psalm 63 for us to glean. David sought God as his happiness early. Early and earnestly. Early and earnestly. Now, where do we see this? When David says, oh God, you are my God, 
earnestly I seek you. Most of the English translations translate it as earnestly, and, and it means with intensity, sincerely. But the commentators, they explain that the word behind earnestly is actually, it shares the same root for mourning. And so this could easily and uh, justifiably be translated as well. Early I seek you. Oh God, you are my God. Early I seek you. And so here is David. His world is falling apart. He wakes up and in the morning, earnestly and early, he is seeking God first. And so again, what would you fill in the blank? How would you fill in the blank? Blank, you are my God. Early, I seek you. Jesus, we look to his example, and I love the verse in Mark 1, verse 35, that while it was still dark, that Jesus went off to a solitary place to pray to his Father. You see, even in the heart of our Lord, that early, he was earnest to seek God in prayer. Now, for some of us, if we're honest, it's as simple as caffeine. <laughs> Caffeine, you are my God. And if we're honest, some of us, it's just, on one hand, just comedic. That just a little chemical can change who we are and the quality of, of, of a person we are and make us miserable or more pleasant for the rest of the day. And so, what is it that we seek first? As you wake up, what is it that you seek earnestly first what's the first thing on your heart what's the first thing on your mind is it the markets now things that overnight or how across other side of the world the markets are doing is it the anxiety from yesterday is it the troubled relationship or circumstance see all those things they're to be secondary those are the things we're meant to surrender to God but our heart first is meant to be seeking God early. And David here, as his life is falling apart, this is what he models for us. And this is in line with other psalmists. Psalm 57, my heart is steadfast, O God, meaning my heart is stable. My heart has an ability to transcend my circumstances and to just stay steady. Why? Because verse 8 in 50, chapter, uh, Psalm 57, Awake my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn as he seeks God. He's longing for God to fill his heart first in the morning. Psalm 108, Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn again. A similar cry. Psalm 119, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. So something we need to understand and think about if, if we're intent on maturing in our faith as Christ-like followers, we need to understand the difference between circumstantial happiness, happiness that just depends on things that happen to us, versus true Christian joy. This is why James says in his letter, straight off the bat in the first chapter, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, I want you to notice that James, he didn't say, feel it. Feel the joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. But he appeals to our perspective. He appeals to the, the power that we have that God has given us to think, to see through a certain lens. And even though we don't feel it on the surface initially, that we think think, that we understand, that we perceive, that we consider what is happening in our lives as something that can be pure joy because we trust that God is in the midst and he's working out his purpose. And so Christian joy is happiness that happens inside of us because Christ from the outside has come into our lives. Okay? It's still a happiness that happens to us, but it's because Christ has come to us and dwelt in us by His Spirit, and therefore now we have a different perspective. Now this is nothing different from the world preaches. They ask you, if you go to your self-help coach and whatnot, your 
psychologist, your counselor. They'll, they'll help you reframe your circumstances. But, so they're on the right track in a sense. But where that should go to its, its final conclusion is no, we need to see our lives through God's heart, through his eyes, and to know this joy. The same joy that even was of Jesus. For the joy set before him that he just shunned the shame of the cross and endured to fulfill God's will and so that you and I could be saved. So this is one way to grow up. Is your happiness depending on just what happens to you? Because even the most disciplined person who tries to, even from a pure heart, try to manage their life. I won't use the control word, the C word. Even the person who's trying to be disciplined and just wisely manage their life from a pure heart, from wisdom, a place of wisdom, you can't control everything. And so we need to grow up in our definition of happiness. And from the first thing in the morning, first thing in the morning, seek relationship with God. If you need a concrete prayer, and and this is something just testimonially, looking back on 20 plus years of walking with Christ, it's been working out for me. uh, And uh, all because of, I think, God's truthfulness, God's just the veracity of who God is and his word. And I think one, if you need a concrete prayer, just in the morning, it's become a habit now. It began some 15 years ago with just sticky notes by my bedside. Sticky notes that say, remember to ask God to just fill you with your, his spirit. Remember to ask God for just more grace today. And I had sticky notes by my bedside and waking up to that and say, Lord, Fill me with your spirit. No matter what I'm feeling from the day before or what's ahead of me, Lord, please fill me with your spirit. Or just simple breath prayers like, Lord, I need your grace today. That was my version of of seeking God, trying to be like David and, and to say, God, you are my God. Early and earnestly I seek you. Just a simple prayer. Not long, just that simple sentence thought prayer. And so I, if you need concrete help with, with learning that, just it, it, do whatever it takes. But like David, oh God, you are my God. Early and earnestly I seek you. Next, I think we should ask then, where? Where was David happy? Where was he happy? And I want you to see first that he was happy. He longed for happiness first in his soul. I know that's a bit abstract, but in his heart, in his inner being. And then his body and the wilderness. And so David says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, early I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints. My body faints for you. Now there's something really profound here. Really profound here. I'll put it this way. If you were with Trinity Grace Church, um, you know, five, six years ago, uh, you'll know that, and I, I shared openly that I, I entered a season of, of depression, something that I had never experienced to that extent before. Suddenly, my, my body feeling out of whack. And to make a longer story short, learning from doctors and reading and so forth that It could be something connected to what you're thinking and feeling. So your soul is, because your soul is down, then your body can become down. And your body and soul are intricately related. But there are times, there are days where for certain I was happy inside, in my mind and my emotions, but my body felt completely down. Like I was, the way I would describe it is just wearing a just coat of chain mail. And barely being able to open my eyes. My body was depressed. And then of course, then that's a domino effect. If your body is feeling down like that, or perhaps you have anxiety and your heart is palpitating like crazy, and then all the domino effects from that, then that eventually leads to your emotions and thoughts unraveling. So David is onto something here. He would say, no surprise, Albert. 
the way God has wonderfully created you is that your soul and body are intricately intertwined. And they're meant to be integrated. Now I want you to notice the order here. First, David prioritizes certainly his soul. Because even if he passed away in the desert, his confidence is that he would be welcomed after life, in eternity, by his God. And his soul first had to be right with God. His soul thirsted for God. And now David, he is crying out a mature cry, a weathered cry from how a lifetime of following God and being loved by God and loving God. He understands he had all the luxuries and delicacies at his fingertips. He had all the silk sheets and the, the, just the, the opulence of the king's palace and all the benefits of living as royalty at his fingertips. And yet in that moment, as his world is falling apart, he doesn't say, oh, my body longs for that wonderful roast that I had. Oh, my body longs for those nice bed sheets that I, I had. Oh, how I miss all of that. No, his body in this moment, this is profound. This is, I, I still haven't, I can't wrap my head fully around it yet, even as I'm preaching to you. But David is saying, even how my body will be satisfied is by God. Now one application here is then David longs for a perfect harmony between body and soul. And Paul, in the New Testament, he would agree as much. In Romans 12, one, he's gone on for 11 chapters, just one of the most profound, beautiful expositions of God's grace. And now he pivots and starts to make it practical how this works out in our lives. And even Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God in response to God's grace to present your bodies, so this is the physical, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And so the physical is spiritual. And the spiritual is meant to be lived out through the physical. Now that there are some here today who are trying to straddle both word, worlds. On one hand, you're trying to live for Christ. But on the other hand, you want to taste as much as you can of the world. Your body and soul are dichotomized. Your body and soul are, are not in harmony. And even in this way, Paul appeals to us, I think he's echoing what David is understanding, that our body and soul has to come together and all in all, holistically, to live after God. Now David here, I think, something that he's also pointing forward to. David couldn't assume that he would, everything would work out well. I think David had enough maturity to understand that maybe he's out of the palace for good. And what David's hope is, is that in the new creation, in his life after this life, that God will make every right wrong, or every wrong right. That even his body, as it's physically, literally thirsting, perhaps he's depressed in his body as well, not only his soul, that he's feeling these things in the wilderness, that there will be a day where it'll all come to end and God will make everything wrong, right? In our Christian hope, in Christ, we know more clearly that we have the hope of even for those of us who are ailing, for those of us who have chronic pain or, or battling something even physically, mentally, that all these things, that in Christ there will be a day where Jesus just makes everything new. I think this is partly what David is, is crying out. He's, he's declaring that ultimate hope that his soul and body will find its true rest and be made new in God alone in eternity. Now, look at the extent to which David is crying out here. The intensity. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. If that wasn't intense enough, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. That's how desperate he is for God. Now, recall, 
And, and this should speak to us. David, right before being ousted, he was really at a height. He, he was at just an, a, a, a peak of success in his life. And so even in that success, having had all that, that's not enough for David to satisfy him. And what he, the one thing he wants to comfort him, despite all the, the, the successful life he's had, to the point that in a dry and weary land where there is no water, that's what he's comparing his thirst of God for. So I love how William MacDonald puts it. And David sought him with a fervor that would not be denied. His soul thirsted for God. His flesh fainted for God. Which means that his entire being cried out for fellowship with the eternal. as a practical application, stop stopping short of God to satisfy your body and soul. Stop stopping short of God. To try to make this a bit more down to earth, how does God, and, and this made me really think this week, how does, what did David mean that even his body was fainting for God? Yes, I get the eternal part. You know, I, I, I hope one day my eyes just get worse and worse. I, I need to go see the eye doctor again. Um, and uh, yeah, just this past week, something happened in my right ear, and there's less hearing in my right ear. Just even in my life, my body is slowly <laughs> breaking down, no matter how much I try to take care of it. And so I, I, I get the eternal aspect of it. I, I long for already that day when be given a new body in the new creation with no more sickness or disease. But I think also how this can be concrete is, as, as Paul says, we're to live out our faith physically, concretely, in everyday material life, through our bodies. I think what God would have us as followers of Christ first acknowledge is this life then in the material world, in this physical world, we're meant to First, acknowledge God as giver. Just that basic Christian truth that God is giver and everything, everything physical and material and all that is a blessing from Him. And so through those things, through our bodily actions and choices and work and words that come out of our mouths, our physical mouths, and the sounds and doing work with what all the blessings that God has given us, that we would somehow feel a satisfaction between what we do in this concrete world that connects with our soul that wants to be satisfied with God and to live unto Him as a, as a response to Him. And so also receive and enjoy everything good as a secondary gift. Secondary, because what's primary? First, Christ. God, You are my God. Then finally, let's ask, then why? Why was David happy? And there are two specific reasons. Because David was anchored by God's steadfast love and sure justice. Okay? This is what ultimately helped David to transcend his circumstances. Even if you're not a believer in Christ today, what helps you get through the tough times in life? I think you could boil it down to two things. A, you have people in your life that you know stick by you. They walk with you through that difficult circumstance. You know you're loved. And then B, there's fairness at the end. Justice is served. Those are two of the deepest human longings. Just to be loved and for things to be fair and right. And so God knows, David knows, and David's human just like us. And so he looks and he's anchored by, this is what helps him to transcend his circumstances. He's anchored by God's steadfast love, his covenantal marriage-like love, and God's justice, that God will make everything right. Where do we see this? 
So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. So he's looking to God and who God is in his very presence, longing for God's very presence. And what does he see? What's the power and glory that he sees? Because your steadfast love, your covenantal love, your marriage-like commitment to your people, including me. Notice, David never forgot, even as his world is falling apart, he refers to himself as the king. That's important because it means that he still knows his identity in God. He hasn't lost his belovedness, his calling, who he is. And so, same for you and me today. One way you will be able to transcend your circumstances is you remember who you are in Christ. And your identity is sure and unshakable if it's united to God's promise to you in Jesus. His new promise, his new covenant, his steadfast love. And that it's better than life. And look, David, even in his 60s, his senior years, he has the perspective, so I will bless you as long as I live. As I get older and older and older, David is saying, Still, what is most important, what is most lasting, is not all my success. And we could go on and on of David's successes and what he could enjoy. But no, it's God, you are my God. So I love how Charles Spurgeon puts it Life is dear, but God's love is dear. To dwell with God is better than life at its best. Life at ease, in a palace, in health, in honor, in wealth, in pleasure. Yes, a thousand lives are not equal to the eternal life which abides in Jehovah's smile. That's what helped David to transcend his circumstances and to still have a happiness, a rejoicing. And so David says, my soul will be satisfied. And I love this, just... David's profoundness. My soul, inner being, will be satisfied and he compares it to something physical that his body is longing for with fat and rich food. I don't know if you're the type to enjoy just a perfectly cooked steak but with a perfectly rendered piece of fat that just is crispy on the outside but then just melts in your mouth. Maybe that's why I'm losing some hearing. (laughs) I don't know, just eating that unhealthy stuff. But but it tastes so good. It's just rich. And David is saying, I mean, here, he's also, I think, just saying what I said earlier. All the good things in your life are meant to be a stepping stone, are meant to be something that points to, something that helps you understand the richness of God's love as a secondary gift, to see the primary gift which is God's love for you in Christ. But this is how deeply David is satisfied. And so as his world is falling apart, when I remember you upon my bed, as my world is falling apart, as I can't fall asleep because of all the anxieties, just chaotically like a tornado in my mind, I still remember you and I meditate you in the watches of the night. And all the more I want you to see that David was anchoring himself in God's covenantal steadfast love. For you have been my help and in the shadow of your wings. What he is picturing is in the sanctuary, in the Holy of Holies, this Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant had these uh, molded cherubims with wings. And he's thinking back to that physical place that represented God's presence. This is what he means by the shadow of your wings. The shadows that would be cast by the candlelights in the Holy of Holies. And so David, he's anchoring himself in God's steadfast love and as we now begin to bring this uh, plane to a landing, he hopes in God's justice. And so he ends But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. David is expressing his hope in the final triumph of God's justice. 
God's justice and to trust that God will make everything wrong right according to his perfect righteousness. Are you looking for some vindication today? Keep seeking God and asking him to work it out in his way, in his timing. And so, verse 11, the king will rejoice in God. Now to end then, I think Psalm 63, it's good and right for us to also understand that somehow, even in David's wilderness, the Spirit was inspiring David to long for God, to look forward to a hope beyond himself, a king that is greater than himself. The king, David, could rejoice because he knew ultimately there would be the king of kings, someone from his own line that would sit at God's throne. And so you and I, to take this psalm and to digest it and to live it out today in the new covenant as a New Testament Christian, we rejoice that the king, The King, Jesus, has saved you and I from eternity's wilderness, from eternal damnation. And we can look forward to, no matter what circumstances happen on this earth, we look forward to that final rest with God. You think of Jesus and where David cried out, Oh God, you are my God. To make this possible, Jesus cried out instead, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That exchange had to happen. Someone had to hear God's rejection, whereas David still mercifully heard the answer of God, and God delivered him, and the story works out that David is uh, reunited to his throne. There had to be the king who instead heard rejection. And even on the cross, Jesus crying out an echo of Psalm 63, I thirst. I thirst. And it wasn't just the physical thirst, but the deepest thirst of his soul for the vindication, the steadfast love and the vindication, the justice of God. And we know that God certainly did vindicate Jesus because he raises Jesus from the dead. So you and I now, Psalm 63, doesn't have to just be an inspirational, hopeful reading, but it can be reality. All the more because of Jesus. You can be certain, this is a psalm I can cling to and I can pray this, because I know God's steadfast love toward me and his justice are certain because Jesus has sealed it. So may you pray in your heart. In fact, if it's stirring in your heart, would you pray this with me now to close the sermon? Lord, help me find happiness in you that transcends my circumstances. Let's respond. (laughs) 